It is not correct to claim that there is no dignity for a prophet in his homeland. In fact, there is no genuine honor for a prophet, a saint, or any common person except within their homeland. This holds true when we contemplate dignity in terms of true glory, freedom of belonging, love, tranquility, and the consideration one feels among their family, lifelong acquaintances, and the streets of their youth. This, indeed, is the essence of one's homeland. Lest we forget. At the conclusion of the First World War in 1918, the world was poised for significant geopolitical transformations. One of the most consequential outcomes of this war was the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, the last Islamic Caliphate, and its fragmentation into small states, with sovereignty shared among the victorious nations according to the Sykes-Picot Agreement. Lebanon was once allotted to France and placed under French guardianship in 1920. After 23 years, specifically in 1943, Lebanon achieved independence through a popular uprising that unified all religious sects and political orientations. Bashar al-Khuri was elected as the first president of independent Lebanon, and together with the prime minister at that time, Riyad al-Sol, they established what became known as the National Pact, a verbal constitution that sought to preserve the significant sectarian diversity in Lebanon. The pact recognized the various Muslim sects, Sunnis, Shiites, Druze, and Alawites, as well as the Christian sects, Maronites, Greek Orthodox, Armenians, Copts, Catholics, Chaldeans, Latins, Assyrians, and others, including Jews. There were 18 recognized religious sects in the country, representing three religions. According to the National Pact, the President of the Republic should be a Maronite Christian, the Prime Minister a Sunni Muslim, and the Speaker of Parliament a Shiite Muslim. This demographic, religious, ideological, and sectarian diversity forms a complex fabric that is challenging to homogenize, especially when considering the differences in political orientations. Consequently, the land of Lebanon transforms into a vast sphere of interwoven wires, or a labyrinth of hostilities, alliances, and diversity. Although the National Pact was an unwritten verbal agreement, it ensured the unity and independence of Lebanon. The Muslims inclined towards joining Syria, while the Christians demanded foreign intervention. The National Pact emerged to unite them and satisfy all parties. However, in 1952, the Lebanese people revolted against President Khoury, accusing him of corruption. He was forced to resign, and Camille Shamam was elected as his successor. This period witnessed significant political transformations worldwide. The Cold War was intensifying between the Eastern and Western camps. The free officers in Egypt revolted against King Farouk, leading to a shift from monarchy to a republic, reinvigorating the idea of Arab nationalism, which had both supporters and opponents. Moreover, it was a time of alliances. The United States and capitalist countries sought to attract as many nations as possible under their banner, while the Soviet Union and communist countries aimed to export the communist ideology and incorporate countries under the umbrella of socialism. As a result of these trends, and with American sponsorship, the Baghdad Pact was established in 1955, including Iran, Turkey, Pakistan, and Iraq. Egypt opposed this alliance, rejecting any alliance outside the framework of the Arab League. On the other hand, the Arab Defense Pact was formed between Egypt, Syria, and Saudi Arabia. 
Lebanon remained neutral and did not officially join either alliance. However, President Shamoun clearly favored the Baghdad Pact and leaned towards the American camp to the extent that, after three years, in 1958, he accepted the Eisenhower Doctrine. This doctrine stated that any country could request economic or military assistance from the United States if it faced a threat from another state. The Lebanese regarded this as opening the door to foreign intervention, leading to their uprising against the president. Furthermore, the situation worsened as President Shamoun sought to renew his presidential term, alongside the opposition's loss in parliamentary elections. The situation escalated further following the assassination of Nasi Valentini, a Lebanese opposition journalist. The confrontation between President Shamoun and the opposition forces took a dangerous turn, and signs of a looming crisis began to emerge in the horizon. Two years ago, in July 1956, President Shimon adamantly refused to sever diplomatic ties with the nations that had attacked Egypt during the tripartite aggression. The situation further escalated tensions with Egypt when Shimon declared his proximity to the Baghdad Pact, a move perceived by Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser as a threat to Arab nationalism. Subsequently, with the formation of the United Arab Republic between Egypt and Syria, Lebanese Muslims sought to join this unity, while Christians desired an alliance with Western powers. Armed disturbances erupted between the two factions, and the situation worsened when the Nationalist Officers' Organization in Iraq successfully staged a coup against King Faisal II and Brigadier General Najib al-Rubai assumed the presidency of the Iraqi Republic. Following the principles of Eisenhower, President Shimon called upon Western nations to intervene in Lebanon to impose security, fearing a repetition of the Iraqi scenario. Consequently, American Marine forces landed on the Lebanese shores with the objective of protecting the pro-Western government of Camille Shamoun. The specter of civil war loomed large, and signs of catastrophe emerged, fearing the fragmentation of the Lebanese army itself. However, the wisdom of the military leader at that time, Brigadier General Fawad Shahab created a balance that defused the crisis and temporarily averted the impending danger that Lebanon faced. Brigadier General Shahab refused to align the army with one side against another and enforced security to protect legitimacy and public facilities. Simultaneously, he safeguarded the opposition forces and their well-being, thus quelling the flames that had nearly consumed the nation yet still smoldered beneath the surface. After the crisis of 1958, Lebanon became politically divided into two factions, the first, led by President Shamoun and consisting mainly of Christians, aligned with the West, while the second faction, predominantly composed of Muslim leaders and politicians, supported Arab unity and organized a formidable protest movement opposing the renewal of President Shamoun's term. The division deepened as the opposition armed itself on one side, and on the other, supporters of the president, notably the powerful and armed Lebanese Falange Party, emerged. It appears that this crisis was the tipping point, necessitating a new leader for the country. Indeed, the Lebanese elected general, Fouad Shahab, as the president, succeeding President Shamoun. However, the Lebanese Falange Party, known as Katab Party, loyal to President Shamoun, instigated episodes of violence in the country. These disturbances quickly subsided with the appointment of Rashid Karami as prime minister and the election of a national assembly that breathed life into opposition figures in the political landscape. Yet, after only two years, President Shahab unexpectedly tendered his resignation, seeking to be relieved of his presidential duties, stating that he had fulfilled his duty to his country during a critical juncture, 
and it was time to return the presidency to the politicians. However, he later withdrew his resignation under popular pressure, initiating a comprehensive resurgence in Lebanon, and his popularity soared to the point where some analysts described it as Lebanon's finest era. Nevertheless, after the conclusion of his term in 1964, President Shahab categorically rejected a constitutional amendment allowing him to run for a second term. He endorsed Charles Helu to succeed him in the presidential seat. In January of the same year, the Third Summit of the Arab League was convened with the aim of resolving disputes, fostering an Arab consensus, and rallying the nations of the world and their peoples to stand by the Arab nation in repelling the Israeli aggression. One of the pivotal decisions made at this summit was the establishment of the Palestinian Liberation Organization PLO, which encompassed the Fatah movement, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, along with several other Palestinian factions and parties. The organization was formed as a legitimate representative of the Palestinian people on the international stage, with its primary objective being the liberation of Palestine through armed struggle. However, after three years, and following several escalatory steps, the then Israeli Prime Minister, Levi Eshkol, declared that if the suicide operations persisted, Tel Aviv would respond vigorously against the sources of terrorism. The chief of the Israeli army staff stated that if the Palestinian Fedayeen activity in the Galilee did not cease, the army would advance towards Damascus. A few months later, in June of 1967, the Zionists launched a comprehensive war against the Arabs, known as the June Defeat, or the 1967 Defeat, or Six Days War, or the Epic of Shishat Hayaman. They occupied Egyptian Sinai, Syrian Golan Heights, and what remained of Palestine, Gaza and the West Bank. It was at this juncture that the PLO emerged from under the umbrella of the Arab League. Palestinian Fedayeen took up arms to liberate their homeland, and the organization established its headquarters in Jordan. The Palestinians also used Lebanon as a base for their operations against the Zionists, resulting in tightened security measures in Lebanon. The Palestinian refugee camps on Lebanese soil fell under the control of intelligence agencies, and their residents endured restrictions to ensure internal security, a situation viewed by some as the initial crack in the pillar of the tent. As a result of the Palestinian Fedayeen operations launched from Lebanese territory, the Zionists initiated an attack on Beirut airport, ultimately destroying it. Despite this, the Lebanese populace stood in support of the Palestinians and endorsed their Fedayeen activities. Meanwhile, the grip of security under President Charles Helou tightened even further, to the extent that even Fawad Shahab, who had previously backed him for the presidency, expressed dissatisfaction with President Helou's rule, due to his deviation from the Shihabist approach, and political maneuvers aimed at reopening the path for traditional politicians to regain control of their spheres of influence. Internal turmoil and protests led by Kamal Jumblat, the leader of the Lebanese Druze and founder of the Progressive Socialist Party, began demanding political and economic reforms. Due to the continuous pressure on the Palestinians, armed clashes erupted between the PLO and the Lebanese army in 1969, after the events of the Cold River, Nahr al -Bair. Following these events, Prime Minister Rashid Karami resigned, leading Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser to mediate a resolution known as the Cairo Agreement. This agreement was signed between the Lebanese delegation led by General Emil Bustani and the leader of the PLO, Yasser Arafat, under the supervision of the Egyptian Minister of Defense, Mohamed Fazi, and Foreign Minister Mahmoud Riyadh. 
The Cairo Agreement legitimized the presence of armed Palestinians on Lebanese territory, granting them the authority to manage affairs in the refugee camps, provided they respected Lebanese sovereignty and coordinated with the Lebanese army. Although the agreement enjoyed the support of most political leaders, in practice, it did not significantly improve relations between the Lebanese leadership and the PLO. According to some analysts, it remained a mere paper document until it was completely nullified by President Amin Jamal in 1987, despite Yasser Arafat's declaration of his commitment to the agreement. The Cairo Agreement did not play an effective role in bridging the divide caused by differing viewpoints between the two parties, with one advocating the idea of the state and the other the idea of revolution. Furthermore, Lebanon was a supporting state in the Arab-Israeli conflict, but the agreement was one of the steps that transformed Lebanon into a confrontational state, to the extent that the leaders of the Zionist entity at that time declared it a violation of the ceasefire established between them and Lebanon in 1949. Subsequent to its departure from the fold of the Arab League, the PLO established its headquarters in Jordan, serving as a launching pad for its Fedayeen operations against the Zionists. In 1968, the Israeli military sought to occupy the Jordan River for strategic reasons, prompting the Jordanian army to form an alliance with the PLO fighters to repel this aggression. A significant battle unfolded in a border village within Jordan, known as the Village of Dignity, where the Jordanian army and Palestinian Fedayeen achieved a resounding victory, compelling the Israelis to withdraw completely. During this period, the War of Attrition was in full swing, with relentless Egyptian Fedayeen operations along the Suez Canal. The Battle of Dignity aimed to cement the concept of Fedayeen resistance and assert the Palestinian presence east of the Jordan River. This led to increased support for Palestinian fighters, and the strength of the PLO grew to the point that, by 1970, the Jordanian leadership saw it as a de facto state within a state. In a bold operation, PLO operatives hijacked four planes, three bounds for New York, and one for London. They forced these planes to land at Dawson's airstrip, near Zarqa, Jordan, releasing the hostages, except for the Jews and six prominent Americans. Subsequently, they evacuated the planes of passengers and detonated them in full view of the media. This operation nearly provoked a U.S. military response against Jordan, which appeared helpless in protecting its sovereignty. King Hussein found himself cornered due to the presence of the PLO. Consequently, the Jordanian army besieged cities where Palestinian resistance was concentrated, including Amman and Erbid, and bombarded the refugee camps with heavy artillery. Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser intervened between the parties to prevent a regional war. He called for an emergency Arab summit and mediated a reconciliation between the Jordanians and Palestinians in Cairo. However, after the summit's conclusion, President Nasser suffered a heart attack and passed away on September 28, 1970. In the same year of 1970, a coalition led by Syria's Minister of Defense at the time, Hafez al-Assad, alongside Chief of Staff Mustafa Tlas, orchestrated the overthrow of President Nureddin al-Attasai, along with the Deputy Secretary of the Ba'adh Party, and influential statesman, Salah Jadid. The one known as the Ba'athist coup in Syria, or what was termed the Corrective Movement. Meanwhile, Lebanon was on the cusp of a new presidency following the departure of President Charles Helou. Suleiman Frangi assumed this role. A curious twist of fate saw him ascend to the presidential seat by a mere single vote, a vote cast by Kamal Jumblat, 
who tipped the scales in favor of Frangi over his competitor, Elias Sarkis. In the year 1972, the official headquarters of the PLO was relocated to Lebanon. This same year witnessed the Israeli occupation of southern Lebanon, giving way to a series of targeted assassinations through parcel bombs, a lethal tactic employed by both Palestinians and Zionists. It was during this period that the prominent intellectual and spokesman for the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, Ghassan Kanafani, fell victim to an assassination. In the subsequent year, 1973, Israeli special forces executed an armed assault in the Lebanese capital. This operation resulted in the deaths of three leaders of the PLO, and the detonation of the headquarters of the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine. This event, known as Operation Fardan, or Operation Spring of Youth, which left the Lebanese government in a precarious situation, leading to the resignation of Prime Minister Saeb Salam. Lebanese citizens felt that their country had been penetrated and violated. The army attempted to regain control of the situation, leading to armed clashes with Palestinian Fedayeen, even involving aerial engagement. However, President Frangi swiftly reconsidered his stance opposing the Palestinian presence on Lebanese soil, particularly after Arab leaders protested his decisions to strike the Palestinian resistance. Subsequently, both sides convened for negotiations, resulting in an agreement or understanding famously referred to as Milkart Agreement. Of paramount importance in Milkart Agreement, was the affirmation that Israeli aggressions in southern Lebanon were not a consequence of Palestinian presence, but rather a product of Zionist ambitions. Consequently, it underscored the right of the Palestinian people to engage in their struggle, and emphasized the necessity of defending Lebanon and its territorial integrity, however, exacerbated the internal division in Lebanon. Muslims extended their support to the Palestinian presence, while Christians, concerned about the sovereignty of their country, held the Palestinians responsible for the issues plaguing the nation. In that same year, the October War erupted, also known as Yom Kippur War. Egypt and Syria launched an armed assault against Israeli forces in an effort to reclaim territories occupied by Israel in 1967. The war concluded with the signing of a disengagement agreement in 1974. Under this agreement, Israel conceded the return of the city of Qunaitra to Syria and the eastern bank of the Suez Canal to Egypt in exchange for the withdrawal of Egyptian and Syrian forces from the ceasefire line. Additionally, a United Nations special force was established to monitor the implementation of the agreement. The Palestinians and their Muslim supporters in Lebanon emerged as an armed force of considerable reckoning. Simultaneously, Lebanese Christian right-wing factions, particularly Qatab Party, and those opposing Palestinian presence, abstained from arming and military training, relying instead on the Lebanese army. The Muslims initiated a wave of protests and demonstrations, demanding political reforms, including the abolition of sectarian politics and equal representation in the parliament between Muslims and Christians. These demands were met with opposition from Maronite Christian leaders. During the summer of 1974, militias affiliated with Qatab Party clashed with Palestinian resistance factions near the Tel al zadar refugee camp. This confrontation foreshadowed a dangerous escalation that occurred in February of the following year in the city of Sidon. At that time, fishermen protested against the Lebanese government's decision to grant fishing rights along the Lebanese coast to a private company. The army was deployed in the city, resulting in violent clashes and fatalities. This, in turn, escalated protests not only in Sidon, but also in Beirut. A few months later, in April 1975, as he was exiting a church in the predominantly Christian suburb of Ain al rumana Pierre Jamail, the leader of the Lebanese Qatab Party, 
fell victim to a gunfire attack that claimed two lives. The Palestinians were accused of being behind the incident. In retaliation, militants from Qatab party intercepted a bus headed for Tel al zadr camp, carrying members of the PLO. They opened fire on the passengers, killing 27 of them. That same night, clashes erupted between Palestinians and Christians. Pierre Jamayel, leader of Qatab party, denied responsibility for the bus attack, while Kamal Jumblat, leader of Lebanese National Movement, held him responsible for the incident. Jumblat declared his alignment with the Palestinians, and the conflict expanded to other areas in Lebanon. Attempts at reconciliation failed to quell the violence, leading to the resignation of ministers from both sides. The nation found itself on the precipice of conflicts and wars that would rage for a duration of 15 years.